Welcome to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network's webinar, Genetics for Pancreatic Cancer. Wage Hope represents the rallying cry for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. It's their relentless call to action to never surrender in the pursuit to change pancreatic cancer patient outcomes. Their goal is to raise awareness about Wage Hope and inspire people to help them continue their fight and drive new supporters to the cause uh, to help them reach their goal to double pancreatic cancer survival by 2020. If you would like more information after the webinar about Wage Hope, please visit pancan.org or wagehope.org. The webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes and includes a presentation followed by a Q&A session. A recording of the presentation will be available on the website under the Educational Events page. We encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the QA panel located in the bottom right of your screen. After typing your questions in the space at the bottom, hit the Send button, and please be sure to direct your questions towards all panelists in the drop-down menu. Your questions will not be seen by other members of the audience and will be addressed, time permitting, towards the end of our session. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Teresa Bretnall is board certified in gastroenterology, and she is a professor in the Department of Pathology and the Department of Medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Bretnall is also an emeritus member of the Scientific and Medical Advisory Board for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Her clinical and research interests include molecular events and early detection of pancreatic cancer, and surveillance and management of patients who inherit pancreatic cancer. Dr. Retinal, I turn the call over to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as you may realize, I cannot see you and I cannot hear you, but you all look good to me. And I'm presuming that you're laughing at that joke. So that, that actually is, uh, you know, my imagination working on my behalf. So uh, as I said, this morning we're going to talk about in susceptibility to pancreatic cancer uh, due to genetic causes. And uh, we're going to go to our first slide and let you know that about 10% of patients with pancreatic cancer will have a positive family history of the disease. So, you know, if I talk to any one person who has been recently diagnosed, I'll find out that there has been other members of the family that have been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in about 10% of people. So the family history can give us a lot of clues as to whether people are susceptible to the disease or not. So what I'm showing you here is a family tree, and uh, this shows two generations. And so uh, the, the squares are the men, and the circles are the women, and this is the parents, and there are the children. And in this family tree, we have a mother with pancreatic cancer and a son with pancreatic cancer. When I see something like this, we shouldn't, you know, it's, it's too many people having pancreatic cancer in a, in a family. So when I see something like this, I am suspicious that there is a genetic etiology going on here, a genetic cause for pancreatic cancer in the family. So this is why it's really important to get your family history and find out what diseases has your family had and in particular what cancers have they had. That, that little finger is just to remind you, important. See, up and down, up and down, okay. So I'm gonna give you an example. There's many registries of patients with pancreatic cancer, but this is an example of one of them. Johns Hopkins has a registry that they published on, and they initially had 362 families that they wrote about. And out of the 362 families where just, you know, you, you, if you have one family member or more with pancreatic cancer, you sign on to the registry and the risk of pancreatic cancer in that group so if you only have one family member, we call that non-familial. So your personal risk, if you're a first degree relative in a family where there's one family member with pancreatic cancer, your personal risk is less than 1%, lifetime risk. So that's very low. So that's reassuring for people. If you only have 
one family member with pancreatic cancer and you're a first degree relative, that would be your parent or your sibling or your child, your personal risk is less than 1%. So it's very low and you don't need surveillance. But if there are two to three family members with pancreatic cancer, the risk approaches 4% in general. Now that's just a general risk number right there. That is not, I'm gonna break it out according to uh, what your family history is and what does it look like. We're gonna break it down into what we call syndromes and I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Not only do people that have pancreatic cancer, in the family there may be a risk of other kind of cancers. So you in your family might have one family member with pancreatic cancer, but there also might be a history in your family of other kinds of cancers, for example, breast cancer. So in the non-familial syndrome, this is where there's only one family member with pancreatic cancer. There's a, there is a risk that the family members will have other kinds of cancers like breast cancer, colon cancer, 12% lifetime risk that you're going to have some other kind of cancer in the family. If you're in the familial group where you have two, three members with pancreatic cancer, that risk goes up quite a bit and you're going to see a lot of other kinds of cancer in the family. So what we're learning from this is that families that have pancreatic cancer also tend to have other kinds of cancers in the family. So we do have in medicine screening programs for other kinds of cancers that are routinely included in the general population. So take advantage of those. So what are the cancers we typically see in these families, both familial and non-familial? We see lung cancer, colon cancer, which you can be screened for, and breast cancer, which you can also be screened for. Now let's break down, you know, remember on this last slide, we had 4% of people who had familial syndrome, two or more family members with pancreatic cancer, lifetime risk was about 4% for the first degree family members. So let's break down this 4%. Who are these people? And what does that number really mean? Well, it's dependent on the gene that's involved. So it turns out it's not just one gene that causes familial pancreatic cancer. It turns out there's a lot of genes that cause that. And your personal risk would depend on which one of those genes you got. So that 4% is a general estimate. But if you want to really know what your lifetime risk is, it would be dependent upon the gene that was involved. And it's important to remember that not all gene carriers are going to get cancer. This is very important and I'm going to get more onto that in just a minute. And I'm going to give you this thought about penetrance of the gene. So this is an idea of medicine that says the following. If you're genetically susceptible to pancreatic cancer with some gene, what are the chances that you're actually going to get the cancer? And it turns out that some genes that cause the disease, they have very strong penetrance. What that means is you're very likely to get the disease. On the alternative is, if you have very low penetrance, it means that you could have inherited a gene, but your likelihood of getting the cancer is actually pretty low. So again, this could be gene dependent, and each gene uh, has its own risk of, of what your likelihood is to get the disease. And we call that penetrance. High penetrance, you're highly likely to get the disease. Low penetrance, you're less likely to get the disease. So this is just a, just a reminder about what this penetrance is referring to. So just because you have a gene mutation, will you really get the disease? And the answer is not always. Low penetrance, you won't always get the disease. And high penetrance, you're more likely to get the disease. So if you remember, I was telling you about that registry where some people inherit pancreatic cancer plus other kinds of cancers in the family. They can get pancreas plus breast and lung or colon. Now, some families only inherit pancreatic cancer. They don't get a colon, there's no breast, there's no nothing, there's only pancreas. And in that setting, uh, we have a name for this group of patients, so we're gonna get to that. 
So let's review the spectrum of cancers you can get in a family that has pancreas cancer. So we talked a little bit about them before, but I'd like to specifically review this. So breast cancer is pretty common in families that get pancreatic cancer, and it can often develop uh, later than the age of 50, but sometimes we see people who get breast cancer even before the age of 50. Lung cancer we talked about, that that's not uncommon in families that get pancreatic cancer. And colon cancer is, again, uh, one of those cancers we see. Just a reminder that people that have breast, uh, that have these risks can get mammography to evaluate for breast cancer and colonoscopy. And the screening for those would be the same screening as the, the general population. Also, we can see gastric or stomach cancer in families that inherit. Sometimes we see cancers of the bone, which we call osteosarcoma. And we can see an excess of prostate cancer. Now, prostate cancer is really common. So just because there's somebody in the family with prostate cancer at, say, say age 80, that doesn't mean that they necessarily carry a susceptibility gene. But when I'm evaluating a family, what syndrome they might have that could be causing their susceptibility, I like to include an evaluation of these cancers, including prostate. Uh, in families that are susceptible to pancreatic cancer, what I would tend to see is prostate cancer at an earlier age than is common. So normally we see prostate cancer age 70 and 80, but if I see it in someone who's 50, my concern level would go up. We also can see ovarian cancer. Now let me tell you a little bit about the syndromes that are associated with pancreatic cancer. So there's syndromes that are associated with pancreatic cancer and colon cancer. Let's say you look at your family and you have, I don't know, two family members with pink, uh, colon cancer and a family member with pancreatic cancer. I would begin to be concerned that you might fit in one of these categories because that's a lot of cancers. Now when we think about how you inherit disease, we would expect those cancers to be on the same side of the family, either the mother's side of the family or the father's side of the family. If they're spread across both sides of the family, let's say your mother's uncle and then on the other side your father's uncle, then I'm less concerned because those people are not directly related. So it, let's talk about syndromes where I see pancreatic cancer and colon cancer. One syndrome is called Lynch syndrome, and these uh, patients can get pancreatic cancer. Their lifetime risk is relatively low. And so for Lynch syndrome, even though they have a risk for pancreatic cancer, it's probably less than 5%. So I would only put these people in surveillance for their pancreas if there was one or more family member with pancreatic cancer in a Lynch syndrome family. Uh, the same thing holds true for a disease called familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome. This is a disease where people get a lot of polyps in their colon and they have a 5% lifetime risk of getting pancreatic cancer. For those people, again, if you carry a gene that causes that disease, I would only put you in surveillance if you have a family member with pancreatic cancer. Now, here are some syndromes where you get pancreatic cancer and breast cancer. And so you might recognize these BRCA1 and 2 syndrome because they're pretty famous for causing breast cancer. But they're also can cause pancreas cancer. Most of the time you don't see that in a family because if you carry a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, your lifetime risk of getting pancreatic cancer is about 5%. So it still remains low. Now if you have a family member who carries a BRCA1 or 2 mutation who got pancreas cancer, your risk goes up and I would put you in the surveillance program. The one above that is called Pust Jaeger's disease, and this is a disease where people get breast cancer and pancreas cancer, and they have a very high likelihood of getting pancreas cancer. Their penetrance is high, and their lifetime risk is 36%, so these people automatically go into a surveillance program. So the surveillance program, we try to rate what your personal risk is. And if it's down around 5%, you probably don't need to have surveillance unless you have a first-degree relative with pancreatic cancer. If your risk is uh, considerably above that, 
you don't need to have a first degree relative. If I know you have Pooch Jager disease, I would put you right into uh, surveillance. Here's some other pancreatic cancer, plus you can see uh, melanoma. So that is a syndrome where people get pancreatic cancer and melanoma, and we call it the familial atypical mole and melanoma syndrome, or FAM. These people have quite an elevated risk of getting pancreatic cancer. Their lifetime risk is 19%. So for these families, I would say, yes, you need to be in surveillance regardless of whether your family has a personal history of pancreatic cancer or not. And so if you're diagnosed with this syndrome, FAM, you might be diagnosed because you have a lot of melanoma. You get tested, we find out you have FAM, then I would say you probably should be in a surveillance program. There's two other common hereditary causes of pancreatic cancer. Hereditary pancreatitis, where people inherit pancreatitis, and they know this because they have pancreatitis when they're little kids, and they can be tested for that, and their lifetime risk of cancer is about 40%. At this time, we don't have a surveillance program for those people, and later in the talk, I will let you know why that is. Cystic fibrosis has an elevated risk, again, uh, because there's chronic inflammation in the pancreas that lifetime, lifetime risk of inflammation in your pancreas does put you at risk for cancer. But just like hereditary pancreatitis, we don't have a surveillance program for these people either. Again, I will get to that in uh, the following slides, why, that, why that's a problem. All right, so probably 80% of familial pancreatic cancer is due to genes that are yet to be identified. So if you came to me in my clinic and said, I, my mother had pancreatic cancer in my brother, and I did genetic testing, I have an 80 to 90% chance that the testing will show me nothing. That we, and the reason for this is because the genes that I just previously showed you only represent a small fraction of what is causing this disease. And we don't know what the other genes are. So people are actually actively looking into this to figure out what are the other causes of familial pancreatic cancer. So that's active research, but we don't know right now. So the vast majority of people with familial pancreatic cancer, we won't know what's causing it. Now, let's say that you do have familial pancreatic cancer in the family. So let's say you either carry one of those genes I just described, or let's say that you have multiple family members and we don't know what the gene is that's causing the disease in the family, but we know that you've got familial pancreatic cancer in your family because you have two or more family members who are affected. So what are the things that could influence whether a family member gets the disease or not. Now remember, there's low and high penetrance. So low penetrance is I carry the, the gene, but I'm less likely to get the disease. High penetrance, I carry the gene and I'm very likely to get the disease. Now an example of low penetrance is the BRCA1 and 2 genes. We know they cause breast cancer, but they have low penetrance for pancreatic cancer. Most people who carry a mutation in those genes don't get pancreatic cancer, the vast majority. Now, are there environmental or behavioral factors that could influence whether they go on to get pancreatic cancer? And the answer is yes, there are. And this, these behavioral factors and environmental factors hold true whether it's a syndrome where we know which gene you carry or it's familial pancreatic cancer and we don't know which gene you carry. Either way, these factors hold true in influencing whether you're going to get the disease or not. So there's a gene environment interaction. So to do these studies, uh, uh, one of our doctors in our, our laboratory studied 251 people from 28 families who inherited pancreatic cancer, so they're familial pancreatic cancer. And we looked at smoking, diabetes, and gender to see whether any of those could influence their personal risk 
above and beyond the fact that they inherited a susceptibility gene to pancreatic cancer. And we also looked to see if the number of affected family members influenced your personal risk. So if you had five family members with pancreatic cancer, does that affect your risk more than if you had two family members? Okay, so let's start with smoking. As you probably would have figured out without me telling it, this is a this is a curve here, and this tells me this is your risk of getting pancreatic cancer here on the left side. So this is your percentile lifetime risk. Top of this bar is 50, bottom is zero, so zero percent chance. And if you're uh, a smoker, your risk is much higher as you age. So by let's say age 50, your risk is already uh, about 20 percent, and also the age at which you get the disease uh, it goes up by a decade. So let's say I say 25% of the people getting cancer, if they smoke, they're going to get it at age uh, 60. And if they don't smoke, they're going to get it at age 70. So now you're going to see quite a difference in smoking and non-smoking. And so these are the non-smokers right here in the blue on the left hand, on the right hand side smokers here. So what we know about smokers is it increases your likelihood of getting pancreatic cancer and it also uh, moves the time frame up in which you would get the disease by about a decade. We looked at occupation and oddly we found three dry cleaners and 251 family members and we would have anticipated we should have had a half a dry cleaner and so uh, the question is, we know that dry cleaners are exposed to solvents and benzene, different chemicals that could predispose uh, to pancreatic cancer. So I don't know here whether this is relevant or not. Did the, the families who had excess dry cleaners, did they inherit uh, a susceptibility gene or did they inherit a business that puts them at risk? This is very early data, and I think we'd have to study a lot larger population in order to know whether this is important or not. Let's talk about surveillance for a minute, and, and how do we do that, and how do we get that done? First, I want you to understand pancreatic cancer and why it's hard to diagnose. And many of you who are on this phone call know that, uh, you know, you might have a family member or a friend who got pancreatic cancer, and frequently they're diagnosed late in the disease, and that just seems so unfair. And so let's talk about why that happens. So we have to understand the disease itself to understand why that happens. So first of all, most patients don't have symptoms until it's late in the disease. The second thing is you can't feel the pancreas on a physical exam. So the pancreas is actually located between your shoulder blades, uh, well, almost up against your spine. And so you can't feel it on physical exam. So nobody can tell that there's something wrong with it on a physical exam. And then lastly, there's no good test to find early cancer or precancer. And I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, we use CT scanning and endoscopic ultrasound when people present with symptoms and we can find, uh, you know, cancers that are um, about an inch to half an inch in size as small as that. But C the, the CT scan can't find things that are smaller than a half an inch. They just have a very hard time. And even endoscopic ultrasound, which is kind of our, our really good test for diagnosing pancreatic cancer, uh, would have trouble finding precancerous lesions. So precancer is a step right before cancer. <laughs> so here I'm showing you, this is a little cartoon I made of the pancreas here. The pancreas is in this orangey color and in the middle of the pancreas going down is this duct. A duct is like a little tunnel. And the pancreas has two jobs. The two jobs are number one is that it makes digestive enzymes to help you digest your food. And so those enzymes are made by the pancreas and they're placed into, they squirt it into the pancreatic duct 
and then they come out into your small bowel here. And so, uh, and then this is where the food is, and those enzymes mix with the food and help you digest it. The other deal with your pancreas is it helps you control your blood sugars by making insulin. Now, the pancreatic duct has little duct, duct, little tiny ducts, ductines, ductules that come off of the main duct. And I'm showing you here what they look like. And the juice goes from these little ducts into the big duct like a big river, little tributaries into a big river, and then into the small bowel. Now, what you need to know about this, why do I bother to show you all of this information about the pancreas is because precancer forms in the small pancreatic ducts first. When we see pancreatic cancer, when it gets large, it might involve the main duct, and it frequently does, but the precancer stages are in these small ducts. And so that is very important when I think, I'm going to go back one slide, when I think about surveillance, we don't have a good way to look at these small ducts. We don't have any imaging tests that will tell me absolutely these small ducts have precancer in them. We do not have anything like that. We would like to create something like that. My lab and other labs are working on creating something like that, but at this point, what I have to go on is, does this look abnormal or not? That's what I'm working with. That's the best I can do with the tests I have today. And so this is really key to know because what does this tell me as a person, a doctor taking care of families who are susceptible? If the disease forms in the mid and small ducts first, don't bother to do a CT scan for screening or surveillance. It's not going to help you. It will not find anything. It costs a lot of money, and it puts people at risk of radiation. So don't bother with that. That's not going to help. Okay. So let's talk about surveillance of high-risk families. So these would be families who have two family members with pancreatic cancer or more. And so and I also include, if you have a family member who got pancreatic cancer below the age of 50, I include those in a high-risk family. My team is a little bit unique in that approach. I think most centers don't include those families. But I think if a family member got pancreatic cancer below the age of 50, there's something really wrong here. And the reason for that is most people get pancreatic cancer in their 60s and 70s. And so if you get it at age 40 or age 35, I just think there's got to be a genetic susceptibility there. And that's why I include those patients uh, in our surveillance program. So in order to be in the surveillance program, you have to have two or more family members, and one of them has to be a first-degree relative. Again, a first-degree relative is a parent or a sister or brother, a sibling, or a child. So one of those people has to have uh, pancreatic cancer to get in the program. And the data I'm going to show you is derived from 100 patients from 75 different families. And all of these families are going to have different reasons why, different genetic causes of why they got pancreatic cancer. But the data pretty much holds true for all of them. So whether you carried a BRCA2 mutation or a FAM, you know, syndrome mutation, or you have familial pancreatic cancer and we don't know what the gene is in your family, the surveillance program pretty much holds true for all of those different causes. So I talked a little bit about where pancreatic cancer occurs, but now I'm going to talk about what is precancer and what does it look like. So the precursor lesions to pancreatic cancer are called PANIN, pancreatic intraductal neoplasia, and there's the little PANIN word, PANIN. And so these PANIN lesions, they share all the histologic and molecular features of cancer. They look just like cancer, but the difference is that they're not invasive. And that means they haven't invaded, they haven't, so they start out in little ducts, those small and medium-sized ducts, but they haven't invaded into the tissue next to the ducts. And the day they invade is the day you have cancer. So as long as it's not invasive yet, you're still in the precancer stage. And the cells there can look a lot like cancer, but if they haven't invaded, you don't have cancer yet. Now I'm going to show you what this looks like. 
So right here, this is a small pancreatic little duct, and this is normal right here. And I'm showing you with my little pencil, and uh, I'm actually going to circle it right now. There you go. So that's normal right there. And I'm going to talk to you about what this looks like. And when I get all done, you guys will then be pathologists. So these are the nuclei of the cells. Each one of those is a different cell sitting next to each other. And look and see how the nuclei are all basically the same size and shape. So we like that. That means normal. And see how these cells are all lined up and they're kind of sitting down, behaving. None of the cells are jumping around. None of the nuclei are jumping around. So we like that uniformity. We like them to behave like that. Now this next door, this duct right here that I'm circling now, this is low-grade dysplasia, or we call it PANIN2. And in this, you can see the nuclei, which are these dark blue circles. They're all different sizes and shapes. Some are big, some are little, some are long, some are short. Here's a short one, there's a long one, all different sizes and shapes. So they're irregular. And they're not sitting down. See, over here, these guys all sitting down, we call this layer that they sit down on the basement membrane. These guys are not sitting down, they're jumping around, and they're, the cells are forming these little wavelets, these little finger-like projections into, this is what we call the lumen. This is where you make your pancreatic enzymes, right here, that pink stuff, pancreatic enzymes. So these cells, all different sizes and shapes, they're not sitting down on the basement membrane, they're not behaving, this is what precancer looks like right here. Okay. So that's PANIN2. And this is PANIN3. This is carcinoma in situ. This is the step right before pancreatic cancer. Now, this looks even weirder than the one I showed you before. So it's interesting. This duct, this is one giant duct right here. It's really actually little, but we put it under a microscope so it looks big. Now, these cells right here almost look normal. Look at that. Those little nuclei, they're all pretty much the same size and shape, and they're sitting down on the basement membrane. But you go right next door in the same duct, and look at this. The nuclei are all over the place. They're all different sizes and shapes, very scary looking, and something that's really important. These cells right here, these nuclei know which way is up and down. They know that this is up, and that's down, and they're oriented toward up and down. These cells don't know which is up and down anymore. They've lost their orientation. And it's not just little waves anymore. These are forming these finger-like projections that are pinching off and flying into the lumen. These cells want to go somewhere. They are thinking about invading. And right now, it's easiest for them just to go into the lumen and hang out there, but it's just a matter of time before they go this way. And this is, when they go this way, they invade into the tissue, that's the day you get cancer. So if they go this way, you get cancer. As long as they stay here in the lumen, they remain pan and three, which is also called carcinoma in situ. And this is the stage right before pancreatic cancer. Okay. So how do we manage? So now you know uh, a little bit about where does the disease form and you know what the precancer disease looks like. And I feel like that's important for people to know because I want you to understand how we approach management of patients. And those two things really influence the management. So how do we manage patients who have a positive family history? So let's review who is at risk. So if you have two or more affected relatives, one of whom is a first-degree relative, we talked about first-degree relative is a sibling, parent, or child. Or if you have one first-degree relative who got it below the age of 50, and only our program in Seattle will uh, look at those patients. Most, most programs do not. Or if you're an individual who has a known gene mutation where your risk is relatively high. Those people are the people that make their way into surveillance programs. Why don't we just take the pancreas out? 
we call that a prophylactic pancreatectomy. So we know for breast cancer genes, BRCA1 and 2, a lot of people just have their breasts removed, and that removes the risk of breast cancer. So why don't we do that for the pancreas? Well, it, your pancreas is really important to you. As I said before, it helps control your blood sugars, and that's probably its most important function. And people that don't have a pancreas, that, it, that's a t it's tough. It's hard on them. So the reason we don't just pull the pancreas out is not all gene carriers get cancer like I talked about before. So you might even carry the gene, but you might not get cancer in your lifetime. The next thing is that morbidity, which means what are the chances you're going to have side effects from this surgery, it's 100%. Everybody who gets their pancreas removed will become a diabetic, and it will be hard to be controlled. They also have to take pancreatic enzymes with all their food. So this is not a small process. And there's a small risk of death associated with total pancreatectomy on the order of 3 to 4%. So we don't just willy-nilly take the pancreas out without knowing that your risk is very high because I can prove that you have panin-3 in there, the precancerous lesion. So we don't want to take a normal pancreas out. And moreover, decades could precede getting cancer. So let's say you're 60 and it looks normal or there's some mild changes in there, but maybe you're planning to get your heart attack at age 70. And so, you know, from my standpoint, I don't want you to get pancreatic cancer, but if you get a heart attack, that's okay with me because you're dying of some other cause. So again, uh, we don't want to take a pancreas out unless we know absolutely that uh, that pancreas is really in trouble. So what is the task at hand here with surveillance? What is our game plan? So our task at hand is to identify patients after they started down the neoplastic pathway. That means after they started getting precancerous changes, but before the neoplasia, the precancerous changes become invasive. So this is really key. I never want to take out a pancreas that looks normal, never. I want to get it right at the stage right before it becomes invasive, the pan and three stage. So what helps me figure out what's going on? Well, for one thing, I get the family history. I try to find out what symptoms did the family members who were affected, what symptoms did they show up with? Did they have abdominal pain? Did they have diarrhea? Did they have weight loss? Some people show up with diabetes years prior to the pancreatic cancer. That's all valuable information. I try to find out how long those symptoms were gone. Did they have diabetes three or four years prior to the onset of their cancer? And I get the ages of the affected family members, and that's very important because that tells me when do I start surveillance. Now, the surveillance that we do, I just talked to you earlier about this. The disease starts in the small and medium-sized ducts. So CT scanning is not going to help me. I repeat, CT scan is not going to help me. So it turns out the test that's best for looking at these small ducts is endoscopic ultrasound. And that's not done at every institution. It's done at some institutions, usually institutions that are uh, in big cities or associated with uh, universities. And the second thing about endoscopic ultrasound that you need to know, and this is really important, is it's very operator dependent. It's like you're looking at a bowl of tea leaves and you're trying to, you know, predict the, the future. You're looking at a snowstorm and trying to make a picture out of it. And so uh, every operator who does endo endoscopic ultrasound is highly trained, but interpreting the tea leaves is really dependent on the person in their eyes and, what you know, the patterns that they can see. And so because it's so operator dependent, I do not recommend that you just go to anybody who does endoscopic ultrasound to get this kind of test done because they won't know what they're doing and they don't know what to look for. So it's very important if you're going to be in a surveillance program to go to a program that has experience doing surveillance for pancreatic cancer. These people know exactly what they need to look for. And this is really important, that expertise is crucial to having a good outcome. 
We also do this test called ERCP, and you guys might have heard about this test because it's been in the news because the endoscope associated with ERCP has recently had problems with uh, getting infections in there. Now, I don't want to say that we routinely do ERCP. We don't. It's very rare we do that. And also, I want you to know that despite these, uh, these uh, news reports, there are safe ways to clean an ERCP scope, and uh, there are safe ways to do this, and you can ensure that the scopes are cleaned by using a rigorous process of quality control. So, for example, at the University of Washington, every day we test our scopes, every day, every scope to make sure there's not a single bacteria in there, and we do have tests that we can use. And so the FDA, together with Congress, are working on standardizing these highly rigorous methods of cleaning the scope, uh, and they will be implemented. But I need to let you know, number one, we don't do ERCP very often, but when we do do it, it can be quite helpful in the patients uh, that I'm concerned about. And also I need to let you know that there are rigorous ways to clean scopes, and they can be tested and they will be clean, and so we just, uh, at our center, we always do that, and other centers obviously will be incorporating those methods as well. Now, I also want to let you know, endoscopic ultrasound, we don't use the same type of scope that's used in the ERCP scope that's done with ERCP, so what's the difference? So you probably want to know this because people are interested in this topic, like for colonoscopy. The ERCP scope we use is different than all other scopes. It's a very complicated scope, and it has very complicated machinery in it. And because of that, it's very hard to clean. It, it, the channels in it, the little channels that we use to do our work, they uh, are they turn uh, make a big right turn at the end. Every other scope, the channel is absolutely straight. Every other scope. Colonoscope, endoscopic ultrasound scope, upper endoscope, all the other scopes, straight channel, easy to clean, doesn't get infected. Only the scope with ERCP can get infected. And again, rigorous methods are being undertaken to ensure that doesn't happen anymore. So there is no risk of infection with endoscopic ultrasound. Um, so I just want to tell you that. The other thing I need to let you know is just with these exams, what we do is we make the patient sleepy for the endoscopic ultrasound, which is the mainstay of how we do surveillance. We make you sleepy. We pass a flexible tube with a TV camera in it on the tip of it. We pass that scope while you're sleeping down into your stomach, and the stomach lays right on top of the pancreas. And what we do is we blow up a little balloon at the end of the scope, which is an ultrasound uh, machine, and we get a very nice view of the pancreas, a better view than you can get through any other imaging method. Um, and we get a nice view of the pancreas, and then we can take a look. Again, the physician doing the procedure has to be highly skilled and know what they're looking at, uh, because this is a very subjective test. But this is the baseline test that we use, and it seems to work the best out of all the tests that we've ever tried. And if you're in a program that has experience, I think it can be quite effective. Okay. Again, centers with experience, that's the key. And there are centers of experience throughout the United States. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of what endoscopic ultrasound looks like. And again, you're starting to get the idea here of this tea leaf problem. So it, I'm going to tell you that this is abnormal and uh, the reason why is it has these little dark circles in it here and here and these little bright dots in it here and here, and that's what makes it abnormal. But you could see just looking at this, you're like, what is that? It's a snowstorm. This is not helping me. So you really need someone who knows what they're doing to do this endoscopic ultrasound. So... In general, if the EUS is abnormal, we would consider getting an ERCP. It would have to be really abnormal. If it's really abnormal, then I want more information about those side branches 
in the pancreatic duct, the small and medium-sized ducts. If I want more information about that, this would be one test I could use. And if this test is abnormal, the ERCP and the EUS test are abnormal, all that tells me is it's all abnormal. The only way I'll know if Pannon is present, the precancer lesion, is if I go and get a piece of tissue and I look at it under the microscope. That's the only way I'll know. So the purpose of these tests is to tell me are things normal or are they abnormal? And if they're abnormal, how abnormal are they? So the endoscopic ultrasound is the mainstay test and if it's really abnormal, I would get this ERCP or other centers also get what's called an MRCP, which is uh, a type of magnetic resonance imaging that's like an ERCP, but it's not quite uh, as crisp detail on those little side branches. So we start out with the EUS. If it's really abnormal, I consider a secondary test to look at those little branches in the pancreatic duct small and medium size, all of this is abnormal, then we would have a conversation about getting a piece of tissue and seeing what is in there. And if I see this, remember this, you now we're going to go back to your histology training. We have little fingers of stuff pinching off. The, the nuclei, I don't know which way is up. They're all different sizes and shapes. Little pieces of these are moving into the lumen, the center of the duct. So what do we have here? We have pan and three, carcinoma in site two. This is a stage right before pancreatic cancer. If I see this, I'm concerned for the patient. You have a strong family history of pancreatic cancer. Your mother and your brother both got the disease. If I see this in your pancreas, I am concerned that you're on the verge of getting pancreatic cancer. Will you have symptoms when I see this? Probably not. Will any other test be abnormal? Probably not. Do we have a blood test for this? No, we do not. So the only way I'm going to get this diagnosis is if I get a piece of tissue. And the only way I can get a piece of tissue is to get a sample of it as surgery. And so very few people ever get to the stage where they have a very abnormal EUS and an abnormal uh, ERCP or MRCP. But when I get those few patients that end up in that category, I send them off and get a little piece of tissue of the pancreas. If there's something focal I can hit, like a little lesion I can see, I'll go after that. If I can't see anything, the whole pancreas is abnormal, but I don't see any particular little cyst or a little mass, then I'll just take a piece of the tail. And then uh, the patient recovers, and I look at the piece of tissue under the microscope with our pathologist, and if I see this pan in three, I'm going to have a conversation with the patient about what steps should we go to next. So if carcinoma in situ is present or pan in three, what I do is I discuss the risk and benefits of removing the whole pancreas with the patient. Now, why do I take out the whole pancreas and not just part of the pancreas? The reason why is because those lesions are going to be present throughout the pancreas. They're not just located in one portion. People that have familial pancreatic cancer, the whole organ gets those lesions. It gets all, all the whole organ gets precancer in it. It's not just one little area. So if I just took out one piece of the pancreas, like the head, and I left the rest of the pancreas behind, what I left behind would have a risk of turning into cancer. So what I like to say is what's in the head is what's in the tail. Usually if I see pan and three in the head, that's what I'm going to find in the tail. So that's why we take out the whole pancreas and not just part of it. Now, there is a risk of panc pancreatectomy, removing the whole pancreas, and we talked about it before. It's not a small risk. I mean, everybody who gets a total pancreatectomy is going to be left. With diabetes, it's insulin dependent, and it's going to be somewhat hard to control. And so here's the issue with pan and 3 There's no natural history study to show what happens to people with pan and 3 going prospectively over time. Like, there's no study that says, oh, these people had pan and 3 and they opted to not have cancer, I mean, not have 
they opted to not have surgery and did they develop cancer or not. There's no study looking at that. What I can tell you is <clears throat> the data we do have is as follows. We do have mouse models of pancreatic cancer that suggest that most mice that have PAN and 3 go on to get cancer. We do have a few case reports of people that had PAN and 3 noticed at the time they had a pancreatectomy for other reasons. Let's say they had a, you know, maybe they had a trauma at a motor vehicle accident and they had part of their pancreas removed and they had PAN and 3 in the part that was removed. There are case reports of those people getting pancreatic cancer anywhere from 18 to 10 years later. So we, we, this points out that there is data to suggest that people could progress to get cancer, but we don't know anything more than that. We don't know the time frame. We don't know, you know, will absolutely everybody progress? We don't know. So that makes it difficult to have a conversation with a patient about management of their PN and 3. And so I really try to educate the patient about what do we know about the disease, what do we know about these mouse models, what do we know about these case reports, what do we know about PAN and 3 and what it looks like and where it occurs. And then I have a conversation with the patient about what their preference is. And they have to usually do a little soul searching. And I also give them training about what the diabetes care is going to be like. So I send them off to the diabetes doctor and they're going to get a lot of training because I don't want this to be a surprise. I want you to be really clear on what is going to be involved if you get your pancreas out. And there's no right or wrong answer. So if you decide you want to stay in surveillance, I am totally 100% behind you and I will continue to take good care of you. If you decide, if you have PAN and 3 and you decide you want to get your pancreas out, I will support that issue as long as you're a good surgical risk, a good surgical candidate. Okay. And then just a reminder that patients who have surgery are going to be insulin-dependent diabetics. So that requires specialized training before the patient even makes their mind up about what they want to do. All right. So in order to get screening in the United States, one has to show that it's cost effective because insurance companies do not want to pay for it. They do not want to pay for it. And this is not a research test. There's no secret research fund that's paying for this surveillance. Not. So if you sign up to go into surveillance, just know that in general, it's not being paid for by any secret research fund. There's no funding to pay for this. It, you're getting clinical care just like you would get if you go to a doctor any other time. And people get mixed up about that. And so I just want to reiterate, this is a clinical procedure performed by clinical doctors in the clinic. It's a clinical test. And so, but even to get this clinical test done, uh, to try and get it covered by insurance, we had to show it's cost effective. And so uh, that's what my group did. We actually showed it was cost effective. And they like to have a ratio. They try and figure out what does it cost uh, how many how many lives could we save, and what would it cost me to do that? And the cutoff is usually around twenty five to thirty thousand dollars. If it's more than that, they start to complain. If it's less than that, they're pretty happy to sign on. So we found that it was considerably less than, for example, colon cancer screening. It's quite cost effective to do this. Mammography costs about twenty two thousand. Pap smear is two hundred fifty thousand for a life year save, and you know it's very interesting if you had to put pap smears have been around so long that they've been kind of grandfathered in, and the insurance companies don't balk at paying for a pap smear. But if you tried to bring the pap smear in today as a new test, I'm sure they would not cover it. And then colon cancer screening varies depending on the institution and the methods used. It can be a wide range. Okay, so. All of those uh, methods are considered uh, allowable, and for screening for pancreatic cancer, we fall uh, well within the cost-effectiveness range. 
The procedure cost has a limited impact, so it's not the cost of the endoscopic ultrasound that is driving what this is, whether this is cost effective. What drives whether it's cost effective is the age of the patient. If you're over the age of 70, it's not cost effective, and the reason for that is because people over the age of 70 die of competing causes. They die of the heart attack I talked about earlier, or they die of, you know, other, you know, prostate cancer, or they die of, you know, other diseases. Maybe they have a stroke or whatever. So there's many other diseases that are quite a bit more common, and so that's where the cost effectiveness begins to break down. I pretty much in my laboratory, I sort of sneak that out a little bit and put it at age 75. I think people are more robust now than they were 15 years ago when we first did this study. The key thing that really drives this is what is your lifetime risk of getting cancer? And so this uh, bar on the left says what is your lifetime risk? 50% lifetime risk versus 1% lifetime risk. And this is what is the sensitivity of endoscopic ultrasound and picking it up. So the sensitivity of endoscopic ultrasound and finding a cancer or just abnormalities is in the 90% range. And it, so it turns out that your lifetime risk needs to be about 15% or more for it to be cost effective for us to screen you. Now this really helps me think about uh, how to manage patients and who needs to have surveillance. So this is an example. You carry a BRCA1 gene mutation, your lifetime risk is 5%. And so it's not quite high enough to warrant surveillance. You have a 95% uh, risk of getting nothing in your pancreas. And so you don't need surveillance. And it's not cost effective to do the surveillance. Now, if there were mitigating factors that increased your risk even more, let's say you have other family members with pancreatic cancer, that increases your risk. If you're a smoker, that increases your risk. If you have diabetes, that increases your risk. So I look at the other factors that would increase your risk, and if they're present, I would change my recommendation. Now your risk has gone up, and you probably could have screening. So for example, if you are a BRCA1 carrier and you have a first-degree relative with pancreatic cancer, then you have two risk factors. You have the gene that's susceptible, and you have a first-degree relative. And those two things together would make me want to do surveillance. Okay. So if you have two or more family members, you probably fall in this ballpark, that alone. So if we don't know what the gene is in your family and you have two or more family members, you probably fall in this ballpark. So in summary, just to summarize where we've been, about 10% of pancreatic cancer is probably due to some genetic susceptibility. Most of familial pancreatic cancer is probably from unknown genes. We don't know what causes the disease most of the time. Penetrance plays a key role in whether you're going to get the disease or not. Penetrance means are you highly likely to get it or do you have a low risk of getting it? And that's very important. Families that inherit pancreatic cancer can get other cancers. So I don't want to save you from pancreatic cancer and then you die of colon cancer. I'm against that just on principle. The heart attack, I don't mind, but the colon cancer, I'm against that. So I make sure that my patients in these families that inherit pancreatic cancer get routine screening with colonoscopy, and have routine screening uh, for mammography uh, to make sure that uh, they don't get these other cancers. Okay, now this is a point I just was reiterating to you. Gene environment interactions influence the penetrance and agent on sex. So if you're a smoker and you're in a family that inherits pancreatic cancer, you have an increased likelihood of getting the disease and your age of onset of the disease is probably about 10 years earlier than uh, what it would have been for other family members. Smoking is a risk factor that we can really do something about, and so I would highly recommend that people that smoke in these families should stop. And in the smoking risk factor, I would include 
uh, snooze, which is tobacco, or chewing tobacco. And I would even include electronic cigarettes uh, as probably we don't know what the risk is, but uh, I would just throw it in there because I don't know. Uh, so really, that's an environmental risk factor that you could do something about. Okay. Endoscopic surveillance appears to be promising, but we need better methods, which we call biomarkers, are needed to uh, improve this. Because, as I pointed out to you, the endoscopic ultrasound is usually performed at centers that have expertise, and people have to be specially trained to do the endoscopy, and it's a subjective test. So if we could come up with a blood test, or we could come up with an imaging test that was better, that could do this better, we would be really uh, hugely improved in our ability to find early precancerous lesions and act on them. And my laboratory is working on this, and other laboratories are working on this as well. And I'm quite hopeful, particularly with the imaging, that we may be getting to a newer era uh, that will work better than the current strategies that we have. Um, what I do need to let you know is that when we do do surveillance for patients, we usually start 10 years before the earliest age of onset. So uh, if the family members in, that have had cancer in the past, let's say one got it at age 70, and one got it at age uh, 55. Then for the first degree family members who are in surveillance, we would start 10 years before the earliest age, that would be 55 minus 10 years would be age 45. So that's usually the age that we start. Okay. Screening is cost effective as long as the prevalence of precancerous lesions or cancer is 16%, 15% or 16% or greater. So that helps drive my thinking about who should be in a program. And what we know about that is two or more family members would buy you into a program. If you have a susceptibility gene, we can measure what your risk is, and we can add in the other risk factors that would uh, modify that risk, maybe increase that risk. Uh, I would make them cumulative. So if you're a BRCA1 carrier, your lifetime risk is 5%, but if you smoke, it goes up considerably. We're well up above 10%. If you have a first-degree family member with pancreatic cancer, your risk goes up. So these risk factors can be additive, and I think about them when I consider who should be in surveillance. And I just wanted to let you know that this work is really the result of a center that's been in existence. We started the first pancreatic cancer surveillance program uh, in 1996. I had a family that came to me, uh, a man who was 30 years old, and he said, I'm really concerned my family, I'm concerned I'm going to get pancreatic cancer. That's what he said to me. And at the time, I was like, wow, I can't imagine why you would be worried about that. You look terrific, and you're not sick. And then he said, my father died of the disease, my uncles and my two cousins. So he had like eight family members who died of pancreatic cancer. And I said, well, didn't any of those people go see a doctor? Or how could so many people die of the disease? So, um, And when you kind of knew it was coming. And he said, yes, they did go to the doctor, and they got CT scans, and they died anyway. So I made a note to myself, don't bother with CT scans. And this individual was the first person that we came up with the idea that you could do surveillance. And we developed our surveillance program around him in 1996. And now we're almost 20 years out, and we now follow not only him. He lived to, uh, you know, go on and not get cancer. He ended up with pan and 3. We removed his pancreas. He's alive today. And not only did we follow his other family members, but we're on to his children now who are approaching age 30 and now are at risk themselves. And so now we've been managing the next generation. We've, it's been quite instructional for us to have this experience over 20 years in terms of understanding how the disease forms, understanding what the risk factors could be, understanding 
what the best tests are to try and look at the abnormalities in the pancreas, but with the knowledge that to get an actual diagnosis, you have to get a piece of tissue. Our team consists of Mike Saunders, who is our endoscopic ultrasound specialist, Earl Hirsch, who is a diabetic specialist, Mary Bronner, who has been our pathologist, and Steve Ruliak, who is a GI doctor who's worked with me, as well as Dave Bird, who is our surgeon, having a surgeon involved who really understands this disease and will work hand in hand with you is, is truly important. It turns out in pancreas cancer, it really matters who does the surgery. This is really important. Who does the surgery? You need to have somebody who has a huge experience, ongoing experience in operating on the pancreas. And the outcome of how people do is wholly dependent on the skill and experience of that surgeon. And so this is another reason why we're very careful when we make recommendations for people that are going to go to surgery, not just in a surveillance program, but also if you have pancreatic cancer, you should really go to a location and a surgeon, a center that has uh, a long experience doing pancreatic cancer surgery 25 or more surgeries a year. You don't want to go to somebody who does one or two a year. And that, that will really reflect the outcome for the patient, how well they're going to do after surgery. We've been incredibly lucky that our patients have done very well after surgery. And, uh, we, we, you know, although they're diabetic, like I pointed out, we haven't had anybody die from the surgery itself. And most of our patients haven't had any marked side effects from the surgery. So we've done very well, and I put that at the feet of Dr. Bird, who is such an excellent surgeon that we really keep our risks from the surgery down quite low. So my point on this slide is to bring up the fact that uh, doing surveillance should be done by a team, a team of doctors that work together. And they need to be a team that have a huge experience in taking care of the pancreas and know how to manage these issues, which can be quite difficult to manage. Um, what I will tell you is the following. Not everybody has access to surveillance centers. And so, uh, and while some people can travel, not everybody can travel. And what I've learned from my families is there is a blood test that can help me uh, set a threshold for concern for somebody. And it's the blood test to look for diabetes. And this is data that we haven't published yet, but we have noticed is a lot of our patients who have abnormal findings at endoscopic ultrasound uh, and those who go on to get PNN3, they frequently have diabetes prior to uh, these changes occurring or while these changes are occurring. And there is a test that we can order, a simple blood test. It's called a hemoglobin A1C. And this test can be done at any medical center by any doctor, and it's not very expensive. This is not a test that's routinely part of your medical care. We usually do this test if we're concerned somebody might have diabetes. Uh, but it's a simple blood test, and it's not horribly expensive. And if you cannot get to a center where surveillance is done, then this could be an alternative where we could say, why don't we take a look at your hemoglobin A1C and we'll follow that along. And if you become diabetic, we know that diabetes is a risk factor because we talked about that earlier, smoking and diabetes uh, in these families. And now I'm going to make an effort to get you seen in a center, you know, that's closest to where we live. And it, we don't know, so there's no prospective study showing the outcome of these patients uh, that get the diabetes, except for the work that we've done. We followed the diabetes in people. I do know that uh, people that have abnormal endoscopic ultrasound are more likely to have diabetes. It's not 100% sensitive, and it's not 100% specific. So not 100% of people who pan in three will get diabetes. And also, not 100% of normal 
uh, patients who have a completely normal endoscopic ultrasound, not 100% of them will be negative for diabetes, but 80% uh, of people that have PANIN3 will have diabetes as told by a positive hemoglobin A1C. And then 20% of patients who have a normal endoscopic ultrasound will have diabetes. And it can help me just grade the risk of patients who are having trouble getting to a center. So it can be a helpful test and it can be ordered uh, by any physician and it can be ordered on an annual basis. So those are uh, some tips I have for people that may not live close to uh, a center. And so with that, I'm going to conclude the talk, and I do think we have a few minutes in which we could answer questions. And so I'm going to turn uh, the podium over to our producer. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Brentnell. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time for questions, uh, but I would like to read that the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network would like to thank Dr. Brentnell for her presentation. Uh, once again, the PowerPoint slides and recording of this webinar will be available at pancan.org under the Educational Events page. A survey will pop up after you leave this session. Please take the moment to share your feedback with us, and then we'll use that to improve future webinars. If you have any questions or your questions were un unanswered during the uh, duration of this presentation, Please contact our Patient and Liaison Services Department at 877-272-6226. Again, that is 877-272-6226. And please ask to speak with the PALS Associate. This will conclude our webinar for today. You may now disconnect.